Bob, and uh, we can kick this off. Sounds good. We are recording now. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us. Uh, we're excited to be able to welcome Rob Henkin from the Wisconsin Public Policy Forum for our Zoom presentation today to discuss uh, reports um, that he has been involved in over the past that show the potential for municipal collaboration and how it can enhance fire and EMS service levels. Uh, the reports also highlight how consolidation can allow services to address capital needs. So Rob certainly has some great perspective. Um, he's been involved with a number of organizations around the state in terms of EMS services and fire department. So Rob, we're uh, welcome to the presentation and uh, take it away. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Josh. And, and thanks for this opportunity. And as I look out at the names on the screen, I see several that are familiar and, and with whom we have worked on some of our studies. So uh, nice to see everybody out there. Let me just begin by saying um, I, I was flattered. I, I saw the flyer or the, the email that went out that I think cited me as the Midwest's foremost or one of the foremost experts on EMS service sharing, something to that effect. Uh, that was flattering. I'll, I'll tell you right off the bat, as many of you who know me know that I am not. What I am is somebody who um, I've, I've been uh, the uh, president of the first the public policy forum and now the Wisconsin Policy Forum for 13 years. Uh, once upon a time, I was the health and human services director and administration director for Milwaukee County. So I know my way around government. I know my way around budgets. I know my way around health and human services, though I uh, have no uh, clinical or educational background in that field. Um, but what I've also done is, uh, I believe now have been part of uh, 10 or 11 different uh, fire and or EMS service sharing study. So what I can provide for you this morning is just some insights on some of the lessons that we have learned, some of the broad observations that we have developed uh, having done these studies over uh, the last seven or eight years. And um, the first several of the uh, fire and EMS service sharing studies that we did were in the Southeast Wisconsin region, uh, Milwaukee County, uh, later Kenosha and Racine counties. We have since uh, branched out and uh, I'll be sharing with you um, at a very high level some of the findings of some studies we did in Jefferson County and La Crosse County. And we are um, at the tail end of a study in Ozaki County, uh, and that report will actually be out uh, hopefully within the next two to three weeks. So I'll also touch on that briefly. Uh, so again, thank you very much for the opportunity. I, uh, I'll, I'll talk to you uh, for about a half hour or so, uh, but then I would like to leave plenty of time for, uh, for, for questions and answers and, and commentary. So uh, let me start sharing my screen. So you can uh, see that the um, title of uh, this morning's presentation is, is much the way uh, Josh introduced me, uh, the dollars and cents of EMS collaboration. So to get started, just a little bit more background in case you're wondering about the Wisconsin Policy Forum. We have been around since 1913. The original public policy forum was uh, created uh, in that year. Uh, our name was the Citizens Bureau for Governmental Research at the time. Um, and uh, in 1932, the Wisconsin Taxpayers Alliance was formed based in Madison, and our two organizations actually merged in 2018 to form the Wisconsin Policy Forum. What did not change upon that merger was the uh, commitment to the legacies of the two previous organizations. Um, and their commitment to nonpartisan research informed and I will emphasize impartial analysis. Um, and the, the mission is to use uh, objective uh, data driven research uh, and analysis to hopefully drive better decision making uh, in local governments and school districts across the, the state of Wisconsin and also at uh, the State House in Madison. Um, if you're wondering how I can hopefully credibly, to some extent at least, in this very polarized world, um, say to you that we are a nonpartisan, uh, fiercely nonpartisan organization, uh, you may be wondering where do we get our, our money to support us. And as you can see from this chart, it's really a pretty equal mix. If, if you were to go on our website and look at our members, you would see a pretty equal distribution among these three areas 
uh, in terms of our membership, uh, corporate, government, and school district, and nonprofit. Uh, several of you work for um, governments that are uh, dues paying members of the Wisconsin Policy Forum. That said, you don't have to be a dues paying member to access our website and to access any of the research that we put out. But we work very hard to keep this diverse membership base. If we had uh, maybe skewed too heavily on the corporate side, uh, people may rightly or wrongly assume that that means that we skew to the right politically. Uh, if Conversely, we were too heavily uh, on the government and school district or nonprofit side, maybe there'd be the opposite perception. So we work very hard to maintain this very diverse group of uh, funders and members. Uh, in terms of the things we do, uh, budget analysis is one of the primary things we do. Uh, we are already knee deep in the governor's proposed budget and we'll be releasing in mid-March a detailed analysis of that budget. Uh, as you can see from this slide, we also produce annually uh, budget analyses for the three largest local governments in Milwaukee County, which are the city and county of Milwaukee and the Milwaukee Public Schools. Uh, and we also now do um, a yearly analysis on the analyses on the Madison Metropolitan School District for the city of Madison budgets. Uh, another thing that I just want to point out to you that I think is a very useful tool because you can use it yourselves to compare fire and EMS spending across uh, any city or village in the state of Wisconsin, but we put out data tools that are intended for public usage. Um, so our municipal data tool is one that, as you can see, uh, provides just information, a database of information in a very user-friendly way on spending and taxing uh, among all of Wisconsin's 600 cities and villages. You can run your own per capita report to see how your community measures up with neighboring communities, for example, and things like police spending or fire and EMS spending. Uh, property tax uh, rates, et cetera. Um, so this is another thing that we uh, provide uh, for public consumption. And our website, by the way, is wispolicyforum.org. Uh, but now to the subject at hand, uh, this is just a smattering of the report covers for recent projects um, that we have done uh, in terms of service sharing. While fire in EMS is a primary area, we've also been engaged in public health service sharing studies. And in fact, we're engaged in one right now in Milwaukee County. Uh, we've looked at public safety dispatch, but fire in EMS um, has been a, a, a big emphasis uh, for us um, and really a big emphasis for the communities that have come to us for assistance. And I'm gonna get into that uh, as, as to why that is in, in just a moment. Uh, most recently, as I said, uh, these two reports, um, a specific look at EMS collaboration opportunities in Jefferson County, and uh, just a few weeks ago in mid-December, we released a report on fire and EMS service sharing opportunities in the La Crosse County region. So I'll be touching on both of those reports. So let me start off with just some, some broad observations about service sharing in general, not necessarily applied only to, to EMS and to fire. Um, I cannot overstate the importance of this initial um, uh, bullet point here. And uh, for those, I know there are a few of, of the Ozaki County Chiefs are on the line and hopefully they can vouch for the fact that when I was first invited in by Ozaki County leaders to even discuss the notion of doing a fire and EMS study, this is the very first thing I emphasized. If, if the goal of policymakers is just to save money, then um, really this maybe is not an area where, 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 where you want to go. Uh, to us, the real promise in intergovernmental collaboration and service sharing lies not in saving money from budget to budget, but in the potential for individual governments to join together to pursue enhancements in service levels and service quality, uh, as well as service efficiency uh, that they could not achieve alone. And so that's a very important distinction. In, in all of the recent studies that we have done, um, the result of that study has not been to be able to go to local elected officials and say, here's how you can save money. Instead, the result of the study has been, hey, here's how you can address some of your very pressing service level challenges and do so in a way that may be less expensive um, than if you tried to do it on your own. So that's a, just a, a very important opening statement. Uh, indeed, we have scoured national research. We've looked at, at, at service sharing nationally. We've actually partnered with, with some organizations in other parts of the country on some service sharing work. 
And um, we would caution that, that pursuit of service sharing only may make sense under certain conditions. And these are just a couple examples. Uh, is there the potential for pending um, retirement of a key leader or leaders in a bunch of neighboring jurisdictions for a specific function? That might just be uh, a, a, a grand opportunity to pursue, uh, pursue collaboration. Um, this is a critical one. Are there any new requirements or needs that obviously are going to require substantial investments in technology or staff? And as a result, might that be an impetus for different communities joining forces? So on the fire and EMS side, clearly, um, uh, you know, if, if there are big capital needs that, that the communities are facing at once, if, 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 if several neighboring communities all have the need to either replace firehouses um, or um, due to capacity challenges to build new firehouses. Uh, on the public safety dispatch side, are there new federal requirements um, that are going to mandate use of, of certain new dispatching technologies um, that can take advantage of, um, you know, texting and so forth? Um, on the staffing level, are departments facing neighboring departments uh, or EMS agencies facing common challenges in terms of recruiting part time paid on call staff? These are all things that might cost money and considerable money uh, to, to try to overcome and may present opportunities for working together. Uh, is there evidence, and this is really intuitive, evidence of either clear duplication or again common challenges among local governments in a region? Um, and finally, is there a previous history of cooperation among two or more governments? And so getting back to a point that I, I hinted at um, in, in one of my first slides. So I, I think when you look at this, you can see why fire department um, and EMS is, is really an area that um, many communities increasingly are looking to see what the opportunities might be for collaboration, because these are very capital intensive and high quality staff intensive service areas that again, as challenges emerge, may be expensive um, in, in terms of trying to meet those challenges. So I now wanna get into a few of the specific studies that we've done, give you a couple broad, uh, just some, some uh, a broad overview of, of some of this work that, that hopefully um, will be informative to you as you think about your own situations, your own possible opportunities for collaboration. So um, I want to start with Milwaukee County's North Shore. Uh, I would imagine that several of you are familiar with the fact that in the North Shore suburbs of Milwaukee County, seven communities, there is a consolidated North Shore Fire Department. That consolidation was discussed intensively uh, for about 10 years, beginning in the mid-1980s, and it finally came to fruition in 1995. And uh, in 2014, as the North Shore Fire Department was approaching its 20th anniversary, we were approached by the leaders of the department and its, and its foundation uh, to do an analysis that we had frankly wanted to do ourselves for quite some time, sort of the definitive analysis of um, what consolidation had meant to the residents of Milwaukee County's North Shore over that 20 year time period. And so I just wanna provide you with a few highlights. So first of all, again, these are the seven communities. Um, each had an independent fire department. Uh, a couple actually had the public safety officer model, which is still in place in some communities in Wisconsin. Uh, so they essentially did police and fire and EMS uh, using the same staff, but there were seven independent departments, um, seven independent uh, freestanding fire houses. Um, as you can see on this map, as a result of consolidation, they actually went down from seven fire houses to five. Uh, in terms of other things that we observed that happened, um, in, in 1994, the year before the merger took place, if you added up the full-time equivalents, so this is not total number of positions, this is full-time equivalents in 1994, there were 114. Uh, fast forwarding to 2015, 107. So one of the results of consolidation, whether from a, a, a positive or a negative perspective, was um, the uh, a, a slight reduction in terms of, of FTEs over the 20 year period. And given the call volumes had increased, um, that's maybe more significant than the small decrease uh, would, would suggest. Um, in terms of apparatus, and here's where there was a big change, 31 vehicles uh, among the departments in 1994, Fast forwarding to 2015, they were down to 16 vehicles. Uh, instead of having seven independent departments, each of which needs a backup ambulance or engine potentially, um, and, and so forth, um, instead of having um, uh, you know, five or six ladder trucks, 
um, or in this case, there were three. So I guess there wasn't a change in this case, but that's often where there was a changer. Uh, you can see it's really the pumpers where the, where the savings were. But, but really, because of a consolidated department, the ability to strategically deploy apparatus among the five stations um, based on call volumes, et cetera, uh, an opportunity to reduce the number of vehicles. And this is really what we see sort of across the board that if indeed, uh, and I'm, being, I'm contradicting myself here, but, but if indeed um, financial benefits is one of the primary objectives, it's on the capital side where those are, are often most easily realizable. Um, train paramedics in the North Shore, and this is just up until 2015, increased from 12 to 33. And arguably having one consolidated department provided the, the capacity, the fiscal wherewithal, um, as well as the ability to recruit and retain greater numbers of paramedics. Uh, so this was, was, was clearly a, a major change in the 20 years. Um, response times, roughly equivalent despite that reduction of two stations, um, because far less use of um, paid on call staffing, um, North Shore Fire Department has a full-time uh, uh, staffing model. Um, the ISO ratings for the areas with hydrants were reduced from fours and fives to the North Shore Fire Department's current ISO rating of two, which is a rating, I, I believe most of you are aware of it, but a rating by the insurance industry um, based on uh, fire protection that is used in setting um, insurance rates for, for property owners. Um, the fact that under one department, there were unified training, uh, unified protocols and communications um, uh, the, the, the key informants that we interviewed for this report uh, could not speak enough about what a difference that made in terms of the quality of fire and EMS response in the North Shore. So bottom line, arguably a far better level of service using far fewer resources was an outcome of that consolidation. Uh, on the fiscal side, and again, here I go emphasizing fiscal when I told you at the beginning that I shouldn't, um, but it's important. And so what we did, we did a very simple exercise. We took the 1993 expenditure budgets of the seven individual departments. The first thing we did was we just adjusted them for CPI, and that was very conservative because as all of you know, fire and EMS costs tend to rise annually at a greater level than CPI. But even if we had adjusted what they would have been spending um, between 1993 and 2014 in this case, because we wanted to use actuals, um, they would have been spending instead of 7.7 .7 million, about 12.7 million uh, if they were seven independent dep departments uh, 20 years later. We then said, what if? What if independently each of them had tried to get up to, generally speaking, the service level they currently enjoyed being part of the North Shore Fire Department? That would have gotten them up to about $14.4 million collectively. And the actual North Shore Fire Department charges to the seven communities in 2014, about $11.6 million. So depending on how you look at it, savings of $1 million to $2.8 million annually for the citizens of the North Shore compared to what would have been spent if they had not consolidated. Uh, I'm not showing you the capital savings, but those were also uh, very significant. So why was the North Shore Fire Department a successful merger in terms of even just getting it done? First of all, there were several retiring chiefs uh, or, or chiefs uh, not interested in heading up the new department when the merger occurred in the mid-1990s. Um, there were elected officials who were committed to cooperation. These are seven small communities that have lots of similarities demographically, and there was already a lot of cooperation going on, and so that was certainly very helpful. Um, this was a big one. There was a mutual threat, um, both based on the fact that the city of Milwaukee, which was increasingly being called upon to provide mutual aid, um, that, that, that it was threatening to actually start charging for mutual aid provision to the seven communities, each of which was experiencing uh, challenges in terms of, of, of their response. Um, and there was a public perception. There were two very high prop profile major fires in the North Shore where the chiefs acknowledged that the response was not as effective as it could have been and should have been because of some of these issues I raised earlier about the lack of unified uh, training protocols and, and coordination and communications. So, so there was that perception. Um, there was the beginning of a growing resentment by some of the larger communities in the North Shore that they were being asked to pick up the slack for the smaller communities and not, not being compensated to do that. Um, and finally, there was mutual recognition in this case that being part of a larger department 
from the standpoint of personnel and, and ability to create career ladders and, and recruit and retain personnel, um, from the, the, the standpoint of being able to have individuals on staff dedicated solely to things like training and fire prevention. Um, and as time has gone on to things like community paramedicine, that that's possible uh, in a big department, but may, may not be possible in a small department. Just a couple of examples, but really mutual recognition among both the smaller and the larger communities in the North Shore that bigger meant better. So let me now turn briefly to just a couple of the more recent studies we have done that actually address service sharing and collaboration. And I know there are some folks from Jefferson County uh, out there. Um, but um, this is a report that uh, came out in late summer, uh, looking at EMS collabor collaboration opportunities in Jefferson County. Just to sort of give you the land of who's doing what in Jefferson County, um, first of all, RBA stands for Ryan Brothers Ambulance. So there is both a private ambulance provider that provides ALS to some of the communities. There are some full service fire departments that are providing both BLS and ALS. Uh, there are some independent EMS agencies um, versus fire departments that either just do fire response or do both. Um, so this shows you who is out there and their calls for service. Um, as we can see, uh, growing call volumes for most. Uh, the Jefferson numbers, I think, are a little misleading. Uh, they had done a paramedic intercept program that, that went away during this period. Um, but generally speaking, increasing call volumes, um, but also generally speaking, not you know, high levels of uh, average calls per day. Um, this gives you a sense of their, both their EMS licensing. Um, as you can see, um, uh, several of the, of, of the communities um, uh, licensed to provide the paramedic level of service, others at the AEMT uh, level. Um, uh, what you can also see here is the extent to which they have uh, full-time shifts. So individuals stationed at the firehouse or the EMS agency who are ready to respond immediately to a call versus um, entities that, that have a paid on call, exclusively a paid on call staffing model where they have to call people in to respond. So you can see that mix. Uh, the takeaway here is that in the middle parts of the county uh, is where the uh, projected for the highest population growth. And you can see that, that uh, essentially a, a higher level of service, um, northern areas have the lower levels of shift staffing and paramedic coverage. So again, this is just to, to, to give all of you sort of the lay of the land here. Um, when we looked at response times, some of these response times, clearly what you would be hoping to see when you think about average response times. And as we all know, for EMS, it's a, you know, there's no one standard. It depends on whether you do have a full-time versus a paid on-call staffing model. It depends on your geography and how much ground you have to cover. It depends on your service volume. You know, we're not out there to suggest that communities that have very low average calls per day should be looking to have any type of a full-time staffing model. But obviously, to the extent that you um, um, our uh, staffing shifts at stations, your response times are going to be better. So this just gives an, an idea of um, uh, the, the response times. Generally speaking, most acceptable, assuming an eight minute benchmark, which happened to be the statewide average for the last year, we could get state data it was about eight minutes and six seconds uh, from the time the call uh, came in to the uh, arrival on the scene. Uh, but this gives you a sense uh, that said, while generally acceptable, clearly some communities where improvement could be could be merited. Um, another very important um, thing that we observed is that the, the the mutual aid framework in Jefferson County um, not necessarily working as well as it could, and notably, as it says on the slide, um, that the closest and mo most appropriate unit unit not always contacted uh, in instances where mutual aid was required. Um, another observation, medical direction, very fragmented in Jefferson County. Because you have all of these individual agencies, um, you also have several of them using different medical directors, um, six different medical directors in the county. And so in some cases, we pointed out this fragmentation could pose a barrier barrier in terms of coordinating training protocols. And, and really, if they were to think, the, the, the main point here is in thinking about having more mutual aid and perhaps automatic aid and cooperation, uh, the fact that you have different medical direction, is that at all going to be an impediment uh, to making that work well? So we, we laid out the future challenges here. And I, I, I think it's worth pointing out to this group, because I'm sure many of you are, are, are facing these. 
Um, in terms of staffing, the recruitment and retention, and we are hearing this across the state, across the board, this is an increasing challenge, uh, finding those rosters of paid on call and paid on premises staff, um, and not only having the volunteers, but having volunteers who are available during daytime hours to respond. We've also heard during the COVID crisis that it's exacerbated the situation, that some who ordinarily would have been able to respond during the day, whoever their employer is, doesn't want them to respond because of the higher risk that they might, might be exposed to COVID. And so that reduced rosters. So lots of issues clearly around staffing. Um, issues around consistency and the quality of care. Should it be the case that if you dial 911 in one part of Jefferson County, there may be a difference in the quality of, of, of EMS response that you're going to get as opposed to another part of Jefferson County. Um, Coverage during busy times. Again, while our impression was, you know, no urgent need um, to act in Jefferson County um, because during normal times, essentially each of the departments could handle its workload. It's during those busy times, those times of high call volumes, um, where the shrinking rosters paired with those uh, call volume uh, increases and 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 looking forward to projected call volume growth may lead to an inability to effectively respond during busy times. Um, fragmented dispatch, the fact that, that there, there are several different dispatch agencies in, Je in Jefferson County, um, not only an issue in terms of mutual aid currently, but in terms of uh, being a potential obstacle to enhance service sharing in the future. Um, and finally, as I mentioned, mutual aid, um, we, we, we saw that that, that that system could be improved and maybe it ought to be formalized. Um, again, and this is not due to the fact that the chiefs and the EMS directors aren't um, cooperative in trying to work together, but there are not any formal uh, procedures in place that sort of dictate how and when mutual aid should occur. Um, we, we Just an observation that that potentially could be improved. So um, we made several recommendations. They were in tiers of um, going from least comprehensive to most comprehensive types of policy options to pursue to address some of these challenges. On this slide, I'm just showing you the most comprehensive option. So we started with some basic things. You know, should there be a joint training coordinator um, for the county as a whole and potentially having that position housed at one of the larger departments or even in county government itself? Uh, should there be joint um, effort to do community paramedicine, but again, could that be housed centrally and, and the cost of, of something like that shared? So sort of starting with little things, formalizing mutual aid pro protocols. But at the highest level, at the, mo the most comprehensive option that we laid out there was potentially looking at whether Jefferson County should seek to move toward more county level administrative control. And this does not necessarily mean that Jefferson County government would become the uh, EMS provider, um, but would they want to look at a model where at least county government would coordinate EMS services across the county, ensure a standard level of care, ensure some standardization in terms of um, expected response times and uh, staff, staffing and training requirements, um, potentially moving to a single medical director contract? Uh, should there be an overriding EMS council at the county level to sort of monitor and enforce countywide protocols and standards. Many of you may be aware that Milwaukee County has that type of a model. Um, and should the county potentially be providing some supplemental financial support, maybe to try to ensure some consistent and competitive paid on call pay scales. One of the issues in Jefferson County is that the different departments paying their part-time staff at different rates. And so they're, they're hiring people and then they're moving on to other governments um, within the county. And, and should, should, could, could that be fixed by having the county contribute some money to help fix it? Um, should the county take a, 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 a more prominent role in investing in new technology and equipment and in supporting some of these joint services? So clearly that could eventually move up to a level where the county, and this obviously occurs in, in, in some counties across Wisconsin, would assume the role as, the role as EMS service provider, um, but it, it also wouldn't have to. So that gives you a flavor for, for some of the things we've, we've, we found in Jefferson County. Um, I want to briefly now touch upon La Crosse County in a report that just came out uh, in December. And so here, this gives you a sense of the participants in the service sharing study that we did. Uh, it shows you the, um, the, the, the diversions of um, approaches of staffing models used in the county, which actually provides both an opportunity and a threat when we thought about collaboration in La Crosse County. So City of La Crosse has a full service 
robust fire department with, as you can see, a, a robust uh, number of full-time shifts at each of its four stations. We have Onalaska and the Holman Area Department, which use a mix of full-time and paid on-call staffing. Um, Holman, by the way, shows one with an asterisk because they have two full-time people on shifts during the day, uh, but they use strictly paid on call at night. And then we have the Shelby and La Crescent uh, fire departments, which are um, strictly paid on call. Uh, we also have two EMS only agencies in, in Bryce Prairie and Farmington. And the La Crosse model, and I know we have a representative from Tri-State uh, on the call this morning, um, but they have their, um, their paramedic service provided countywide by a private nonprofit uh, ambulance provider, Tri-State. Um, the one uh, fire department in La Crosse County that also has a paramedic license and provides a paramedic level of service is La Crosse. Uh, there's a really nice cooperative relationship between La Crosse Fire Department and Tri-State that some of you may want to look at for, for your departments, um, but really sort of a mix of provision of EMS services uh, across La Crosse County. Um, and La Crescent actually is, is over the border in, in, in Minnesota, but is part of the, of the region. Um, this shows you that growing call volumes a real big issue and in the Holman area service area it's a result of that's where the development is occurring in this in this county and it's occurring very rapidly. But you can see even La Crosse, which really isn't growing in terms of population, um, seeing a, a pretty sizable change in terms of growing call volume. So this was a common challenge. Uh, response times, as you might expect, um, the areas that are making greater use again of full time uh, staffing. Um, having better response times, the areas um, that are both more geographically distant and that are using paid on call staff, uh, not seeing um, the, the, the response times that, that, that La Crosse and on Alaska see. Um, in terms of sort of the big picture, what's the problem here in La Crosse County? Um, again, much like Jefferson, departments with sufficient capacity to respond to, to normal conditions, but really being stretched thin during times of high call volumes. This growth that's occurring in the northern part of the area, in the Holman area, um, clearly is going to require added fire and EMS capacity. And that's an issue not only for the Holman area department and the, uh, the, the, the villages and towns that, that it serves, but really to the entire region, because increasingly other departments in the region needing to provide mutual aid. Um, and so um, how the Holman area fire department responds to that challenge obviously will have impacts on the others. Um, in La Crosse County, a lower level of mutual aid than we've seen in other regions, a, a, a full-time, well-resourced La Crosse department that often is not being called upon when mutual aid is necessary um, due to a variety of factors that really have nothing to do with closest unit. And so that was an observation. Um, we observed again that the two-tiered EMS response is working well, having Tri-State provide the, the, the paramedic response and, and having the departments and the EMS agencies provide the first response. Uh, but in the eastern part, the less populated, more geographically dispersed part of the county, uh, response times could be improved. And once again, recruitment and retention of part-time staff for those using it, uh, a really big challenge. Uh, here too, we presented three tiers of options from less comprehensive to more comprehensive. I uh, just want to focus on the advanced options for a second. Um, here we looked at the possibility of station sharing. Um, three of the five full fire departments um, actually are considering adding a station. And so in one case for Onalaska and La Crosse, both considering adding a station in very close proximity to one another. So the concept of station sharing. Uh, a fourth has a station that is badly in need of either um, major repair or full replacement. And that station in, 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 in Shelby, the town of Shelby, very close to where La Crosse is thinking of adding a fifth station. So clearly some potential for sharing of stations as uh, already occurs in some parts of the state. A prominent example is uh, uh, South Shore and Caledonia in Racine County uh, share a station. Um, the possibility of some of the smaller departments actually contracting for service with a larger La Crosse department is something we looked at. Um, and we also looked at a single consolidated department. Just to give you a little bit more flavor, this shows, and again, we're not here to argue about the merits of full-time staffing and contracting versus communities maintaining their independence and having small departments with paid on-call staff. But in this case, again, when just taking a look at Shelby, from, uh, from, from the middle of Shelby to the nearest station in La Crosse, uh, and mind you, La Crosse has full-time staffing, La Crosse could potentially respond 
to a call in three minutes, um, which would certainly at, at least want to raise the question as to whether Shelby, the residents of Shelby might be better served. You may recall from a previous slide that their average response times were about in the 10 minute range um, by instead contracting with La Crosse. And, and again, there are pros and cons, and there are certainly um, pros in terms of wanting to maintain that independence and not wanting to go that route. But uh, again, what we observed is in terms of travel times, this notion of contracting with La Crosse, some of these communities could actually receive better response times under such a framework. We also looked at a hypothetical consolidated department that would add three stations throughout the region. Uh, but again, I, as I said, there's the possibility of, of actually four or five new stations being added if they look to do so independently. And one of the very important things that we found here was that um, while the cost of that consolidated department would be about $2 million because of the additional capacity and greater movement toward full-time staffing, though we, we actually modeled sort of a hybrid model still between full-time and part-time. Um, if each of these departments, we looked at what they would ostensibly need to do individually to address their service challenges over the next five to 10 years, and we found that that cost would be about $2.8 million, so about $800,000 more than the jurisdictions would need to incur collectively under our consolidated department scenario. Finally, last but not least, I mentioned that we are going to be releasing a study on Ozaki County uh, sometime within the next two to three weeks in all likelihood. Uh, I am not going to tell you what the results of that study are, but it's just helpful to just again lay out the challenges uh, very briefly in Ozaki County because they're so common to so many of you. So this is the service framework, uh, the geography of Ozaki County, the number of statements uh, or stations, uh, the number of communities that are maintaining their own individual departments. Um, big problem here um, in terms of growing calls for service as well. And as you can see, the vast, vast majority of, of calls are for EMS. So to the extent that there are challenges in Ozaki County, it's really an EMS challenge. And I think that's you know, likely the case if, 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 if we look at, at, at other counties throughout the state. Um, different frameworks, but what is unique about Ozaki County is that even some of the larger communities and larger departments in places like Mequon and Grafton and Fort Washington, um, while greater numbers of uh, full-time equivalents still making um, almost exclusive use of part-time paid on call staff. There is a move in Mequon and Grafton and Port and Cedarburg to start to add a full-time level of staffing, but it's still in its nascent stages. And for the most part, each of these departments is um, leaning on calling in people to respond not only to fires, which would be intuitive, um, where you need to assemble more people, but even to respond uh, to uh, uh, calls for EMS. Um, as you can see, response times as a result of the use of paid on call staff, um, arguably higher than you might expect to see in a county that in some respects is, 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 is somewhat rural, but in other respects is, is really very suburban. And so clearly some challenges um, in terms of the, the um, challenges that we observe um, here, the reliance on paid on call because it is so extensive is, is really a problem. And that's especially on weekdays um, and, and times of high call volumes. Um, clearly an opportunity to improve response time. So that has to be weighed against the investment in full-time staff and, and whether that's deemed affordable and necessary. Um, but increasingly looking to be necessary as increasingly there are times when some departments are simply unable to assemble su uh, sufficient staff to respond. Um, one of the challenges here is that the communities in the northern part of the county have clearly different needs and expectations than the communities in, south, in the south. And so all working together may not work very well. Um, and a key question is, are elected officials and citizens willing and able to, to spend a lot more on their fire and EMS? Uh, finally, the question, another question for Ozaki County is whether they should consider a model in which EMS would be broken out and potentially a, a lacrosse type of a model where advanced life support services and paramedic services uh, provided separately um, and fire departments being leaned on for just first response and fires. Um, so finally, last slide, I promise. Um, nope, second to last slide, I lied. Um, Overall lessons learned from all of this, and I've touched upon all of these, uh, don't want to repeat myself, but again, if you're going to look at service sharing and cooperation and collaboration, be clear about objectives, and if it's just about dollar savings, then maybe it's not worth the effort. 
so critical. Each of our studies has, has really um, made a, a, an effort to, to uh, very much engage fire chiefs, EMS directors, medical directors, other stakeholders, not only because we require that expertise because we don't have it, but because it's so important to then be able to uh, present this study to policymakers um, to, to have those individuals who can credibly convey the importance of appropriate service levels. Very clear that one size doesn't fit all. I can't say you, there's one approach that every county in Wisconsin should be taken. It very much has to be tailored toward local conditions and local service expectations. Um, and it's so important to be just as clear about the consequences of not merging or cooperation or cooperating as you are about the benefits. Oftentimes it's not looked at that way. Um, hey, why should I give up my independence? Um, but not enough thinking about well, what happens if you don't and if you have to confront your problems on your own going forward. Uh, speaking of going forward, as we just look out over the landscape, we see that enhanced service sharing and consolidation is going to continue to offer great promise, particularly in capital intensive um, and high quality and trained staff intensive areas like EMS. Um, we know that municipal fiscal constraints are intensifying. Um, we hope that the tight labor market will return and it's still tight, tight. Um, and you know, the, the recruitment and retention issues, especially for, for both highly skilled staff and also these paid on call positions is going to remain a challenge. And again, capital budgets for, for local governments across the board are really emerging as one of the foremost fiscal challenges. So I've talked a lot. Um, I would love to engage all of you in some questions and discussion. So I'm going into the chat right now. So one approach is somebody can simply turn on their mic and ask a question or turn on their camera and I might be able to see you. Um, but I can also start addressing. Hey, uh, Rob, sorry about that. This is Joshua. <laughs> we, we, I was, I was muted. So I guess I, first of all, I want to thank uh, Rob for this great presentation. Um, before we open it up to questions, I'd, I'd like to share uh, a little commercial about our organization, WEMSA, the group here, and I'd also like to introduce our new executive director, Alan DeYoung. Alan DeYoung. Um, just kind of a quick commercial here. We're, we've, we were established in, in 1974. WEMSA is the largest EMS organization in Wisconsin that represents nearly 300 services and 6,000 emergency medical professionals in Wisconsin. Uh, as an organization, we represent the views and interests of our membership by promoting education, sharing information, and facilitating legislative action. Uh, we have a number of opportunities for, both, for members, both individual and services to be involved through our committees and through programming uh, related to topics like board service, advocacy, women in EMS, young professionals in EMS, and a new coalition of, uh, that we're putting together of services um, with to provide a voice for services with lower call volumes across the state. Uh, please feel free to contact uh, either me or Alan to learn about the myriad of membership opportunities and services. Alan's going to give a quick little highlight on that. Um, and thanks again, Rob, for, for taking time today to share this valuable information uh, and really adding some great information to what has become a, a very popular discussion around our state. Um, specifically on this as a follow-up, we would welcome those of you who are interested in, in continuing this discussion co to contact us at WEMSA as we continue to address this particular issue of consolidation. Uh, in terms of context, the, the, we will put this up at the, at the end of the presentation. Uh, I'll put it up in the chat. You can email us at WEMSA, W-E-M-S-A, at WisconsinEMS.com, um, or visit the WEMSA website, which is WisconsinEMS.com. So we're, we're certainly gonna, gonna take some questions. Alan, why don't you introduce yourself too as the, as the new executive director of WEMSA? Hi, everybody, and thank you again for, for joining us. Thank you, Rob, again. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, as you notice, there's a lot of questions coming in. Uh, everybody, so I, I actually started with WEMSA back in 2018, so I, I'm very familiar with a lot of our members. Uh, I know that there's both members and non-members on this, so hopefully everybody found it pretty informational. Um, I don't want to go too much into details, but uh, we hope that everybody joins us uh, as a member. If you're not a member, 
uh, for any other you know webinars that we host like this. Uh, obviously, it's being recorded, and we will actually be posting this uh, for our members uh, specifically. So anybody that missed out, I know we actually had a over 200 people register for this. So I know that there's a lot of people that probably weren't able to make it. Um, Rob, I'm actually going to let you, if you want to, run through just the the comments, so I don't have to read them all, you know, back and forth with you. I'll let you just kind of answer them as as you want to. Great. So I'm in them now. Uh, you don't have to pick the hard ones either, Rob, whatever you want. <laughs> okay. Well, so first of all, um, I will send the slides to Josh. And uh, so uh, for people who want access to the slides, absolutely. Um, I will also add that all of the reports that I've discussed are available on the Wisconsin Policy Forum's website. So those are available to anybody as well. Um, so let me just also uh, 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 address a couple quick ones. Um, uh, we have not done studies on uh, the increase of lift assist calls, though I think that would be a, a very relevant thing to look at. Um, I, we, I've been asking, are, are we considering studying a rural area? So we actually, um, we just launched a little bit of a different study for uh, the uh, Union Grove Yorkville uh, Fire Department. So those are two communities in Racine County um, that, um, instead of this being a service sharing study, it's sort of a needs assessment study. Uh, they would like us to take a look at their service model, um, at their level of apparatus, at their level of staffing, and compare them to fire and EMS agencies um, in similar size communities with similar call volumes and similar demographics, and try to get a sense from that as to whether they are over or under resourced. So, that could potentially then lead to an option study, which may or may not include service sharing. Uh, so we, we've started that one, um, and I wouldn't certainly deem Union Grove and Yorkville as, as, as purely rural. Um, but for those of you out there who are looking for assistance, um, we have a, a, a relatively small staff and we don't have a lot of capacity, but we're here to try to serve all of you um, and your governments in just trying to um, be more effective and more efficient. So. Um, uh, yes, while we haven't done, there's another one, have we done any studies across towns and truly small rural? We haven't, um, but we, we do possess that capability hypothetically. Um, one person asked, do we do prospective studies to compare and contrast different future paths? And uh, yes, we do. And in fact, we're doing that now. We're just launching a follow-up in Racine where we did an initial service sharing study. And now for the greater Racine communities, we are i um, going to dive much deeper into the options and what the different paths might, might look like. Um, here's a question. Does your data tool include towns? As you only mentioned cities and villages, unfortunately it doesn't. We'd like to add towns, but right now it's limited to, to cities and villages. Um, here's a question. How does a community that already shares fire and EMS with multiple towns, villages? Um, acquire a study to show our effectiveness. So um, again, we, we did such a study for the North Shore Fire Department. Um, for us, we have a staff, I should tell you a little bit more about us. Um, we have a staff of 10 people, uh, offices in Milwaukee and Madison. Uh, we have roughly uh, six or seven of those people are researchers. Um, we, when, when we take on a project that involves spending considerable research time, a three or four month research project, we do need to seek an outside source of funding to support that. Uh, the good news is we're, we're, we're a nonprofit and we support part of the cost of each of our studies um, with our discretionary resources, like our membership dues, um, and we have various grant funding. Um, so we are very inexpensive, um, but we do require um, typically some support. So again, for those of you who are looking for such studies, um, we're, we're happy to talk. Um, but just, you know, they, I, I wish they could be free, but in, in, in all likelihood, they, they would not be free. Um, somebody's asking whether we have any general tools that are available for municipalities to use on their own. And again, outside of the fact that these studies are all available on our website, we haven't developed anything yet, but I think that's a great idea actually. And what we have been thinking about doing when we finally have a chance uh, is to take a step back and maybe write a report 
that would sort of lay out some, some sort of commonalities that we are seeing and, and maybe even try to get at metrics and standards where like, hey, if you're wondering, you know, how your EMS response compares, you know, across several different communities your size, you know, in terms of staffing levels, in terms of response times, uh, in, in terms of mix of different types of staff, um, you know, in terms of are, are, are you doing any community paramedicine, things like that, that establishing sort of a central database or something um, that would be available would be a great thing for us to undertake and which again, we could use our discretionary resources to do it. So um, I'm seeing somebody is saying, yes, do that. Um, great idea. So uh, it's, it's on the list of, of potential WPF uh, research projects, but really and truly we've done enough of this work. I think it'd be a great thing to do and we'll, we'll hopefully get to it. Um, so I've covered a bunch. Alan, I don't know if you want to. Uh, I was about to say, I know there's a few people that messaged me that said they had com um, questions. You can feel free to put them in the chat or if you want to unmute yourself, certainly can do so. And if it's a more complicated question, you can also email us, Wemza at wisconsinems.com um, and we can send those over to Rob and, and let him answer as he has time here too. Cause I know there's some very complicated scenarios people are, people are wondering about for their region. So um, yeah, feel free. Any more questions, um, feel free to unmute. And now on to build on that, um, you know, we're at the, at WEMSA, we're certainly open to continuing this dialogue. We don't, I guess we're not going to, we're not going to solve all the problems today and, you know, in the next eight minutes. And so for those of you that would like to continue the dialogue, um, you know, we're like Alan mentioned, please feel free to email us as, you know, we're hoping to continue to put together an ongoing dis discussion group and, and additional programming about this issue in the coming year. So. Hey, Alan, uh, Alan, right. this is uh, yeah, this is uh, Chief Vantis of Town of Grand Chute, Wisconsin State Fire Chiefs Association. Um, I want to thank you and uh, WEMSA for putting on this uh, presentation. Um, very informative. Um, my question or comment maybe to, to Rob is this, is that the Wisconsin State Fire Chiefs have been very active in this last three or four years, especially. Um, but I, I think it really comes down to uh, when we talk to municipalities as far as chiefs go, um, it really comes down to financing. Um, and what I mean by that is, is how are these um, joint ventures, contractual departments funded, right? You can say all you want about uh, the fire chiefs um, and things like that. I will tell you that in my, you know, in my 13, 14 years of dealing um, within the fire service and, and having this as a top issue and talking to political bodies across the state on this is it really does come down to um, the fair and equitable funding of these agencies. And right now the Wisconsin state laws do not allow that to occur. Um, they just don't. They don't allow for what would you would call districting. The actual funding of a district fire EMS doesn't matter. Um, it's not allowable under Wisconsin state statute at this point. That's independent funding, okay? Equal, equal funding from all municipalities being the same. Um, one of the things that you talked about was cooperation amongst municipalities. I would go a step further that um, for really to be successful in what you've seen is those, those communities need to be similar or like communities to work appropriately. It's really hard to have anything uh, with a, a department that's running 100 calls a year, um, and then in a different part of the county, they're running 2,000 calls a year. That, that, that sharing of those services and that cost are, are, are greatly skewed for that. Um, but I would tell you this, I, I think that, um, I, know you're not, I know you're not a political body, and. and and I get that, and I, I appreciate that tremendously. But really, um, we have seen in the state of Wisconsin, especially the last three years, that departments that have consolidated and contract through contractual basis. If you have, you know, four departments, and one of those departments or one of those cities or municipalities is doing extremely well, and another is doing uh, poorly in their development, that tax base shift um, causes a tremendous amount of pressure. And typically we have seen a lot of those departments split apart and then now you have to redevelop new departments. Um, so if you wanna look at the root cause, which I would tell you the root cause is, it really does come down to fair and equitable funding. And until that's addressed um, at the state level, 
I think that um, while it's great to have these discussions and I totally 100% support it, it becomes very difficult to come out on the positive end. And, uh, but I think we still need to keep having these discussions. We still need to move things forward because that's how you, that's how you affect change. And that's what's gonna need to happen. Thank you. Thanks, Pam. Just my really brief response is I don't, I don't think there's anything that you said that I disagree with. Um, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. And, and um, clearly in some cases, legislative action would be needed to allow for some of this. In other cases, one of the, one, one of the advantages of potentially looking at county involvement is that, as I'm sure most of you are aware, uh, EMS does fall out outside of the levy limits uh, for counties. And, you know, and you'd hate to have that be the, 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 the driver to wanting to, you know, you don't want to create a, a, a way of doing business just to get around a funding restriction. You Optimally, you're going to do it based on what's best uh, from a programmatic perspective. But that, again, is right now uh, a reason to potentially look at a greater county role in some communities. But I guess the final thing I would say is, you know, even we're, we're, we're celebrating the celebrating the, I, I probably shouldn't use that word, but um, it's the 10th anniversary of, of Act 10. And to me, one of the biggest regrets to me about Act 10 is that it, that was an opportunity to try to also look at changes in state law that would provide both sticks and carrots to encourage municipalities and counties to really look at enhanced service sharing and consolidation. Because you're absolutely right. There are right now certain restrictions in state law that even if you folks wanted to, you have dis disincentives for doing it. And I think that's another big piece of the puzzle that this state hasn't tackled is um, how do you get communities, how, how do you make it easier for communities to work together instead of uh, putting up roadblocks? Definitely. Um, I know there's a few more questions in there too, and I want to be respectful of time, obviously, because we're 1057 here. So uh, up to you, Rob, if you want to answer another question or two, or we can just direct people to uh, email us, WEMS at Wisconsin EMS, and we can kind of go from there. Yeah, I just one very quickly, um, Carl Fortner asked, what, what, what do I see as the greatest impediments to consolidating departments? Um, you know, I think we've hit a, 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 upon a few. First of all, um, you know, there's great community pride in many cases um, in, in having your own individual fire department that is also providing paramedic level of service. And, and, and again, nobody is saying that that, that should disappear. Um, it's just that with today's fiscal realities, and again, the realities of recruiting these, these paid on call staff, you, you may not have choice. But but so, but but just community pride and not wanting to give up that local control is clearly an impediment. And I and again, I don't want to suggest that's necessarily not a justifiable reason. Um, I think this finding the right partners, um, as, as the previous speaker said, um, you know, City of Milwaukee is not going to merge its fire department with the Village of Hales Corners. Um, in that case, you know, it would be a contractual arrangement. It wouldn't be a, a, a true merger. But Finding partners who are both alike in uh, enough demographically and in terms of call volumes and also that don't have animosities that have built up over time, that, that's, that's certainly a challenge as well. Cool. Uh, uh, we are just about at 11 here, so I'm going to encourage everybody else to email us at Wemza Wisconsin EMS. Thank you, Rob. This is definitely informative. Like I said, to continue having these conversations, these are great. Thank you all. Very nice to be here today. Thanks a lot, Rob and Alan both. Appreciate everyone attending. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you guys.